Jordan Grummet, a.k.a. Doc G. I'm excited to have you here, man. I know you uh, and the world knows you as a medical doctor, current medical doctor, uh, worked in hospice or work in hospice care. Uh, but I also know you're a successful, really successful personal finance blogger, podcaster, award-winning podcaster, uh, a show called Earn and Invest, and you're author of actually a phenomenal book I just got finished reading this morning in preparation for this, but I loved every page of it called Taking Stock, A Hospice Doctor's Advice on Financial Independence, Building Wealth, and Living a Regret-Free Life. That's how I know you, uh, Mr. Doc G. Mr. Doc G. <laughs> <laughs> that works. Yeah, that yeah, works. Okay. But, but take me back earlier. Who was uh, Doc G before you were Doc G? I was a seven-year-old kid who was pulled out of school by a next-door neighbor to be taken to the hospital to find out that my father died suddenly of a brain aneurysm. Oh, geez. Seven. Seven. And at that time, I had no understanding of how the world worked. All I knew was I was seven. And at that, you know, when you're that age, you think mm. the world revolves around you. And so the lens that I looked at the world through told me that it was my fault mm. that he died because I did something wrong. Jeez, yeah. And I struggled for months and months and months to figure out how to make this right. And at some point, I decided that if I could just do what he did, he was a doctor, an oncologist who took care of cancer patients. If I could just be a doctor like him, I could somehow right this existential wrong and make the world better. Jeez. I mean, my daughter Rosie is seven years old right now, and I just think of if I were to pass away. Dude, I wasn't even planning to go here, but I will ask the question. As somebody who works in hospice, and I know we'll get to all that, should we make videos for our children in case we pass away? Like, this is not your fault. This is, you know, should we, should we, should we do that? And if so, what, what does that look like? So I think that's a reasonable thing, especially when they're really young. Mm -hmm. But I think the best thing you can do for your children is live a full, purposeful life mm. and be involved in theirs. And I think ultimately, that's what makes it okay. Like when they see that you were joyful and that you were doing the things that were important to you, God forbid something were to happen to you before anyone thought it would, they'll have that memory of you doing those things that were important and it will be a model for them as they grow older. But I do advocate having those conversations. Like I yeah. go to my kids all the time and I say, look, you know, I'm 50 years old. I've accomplished everything I want to in the world. If I were to drop dead tomorrow, you know, you can be sad and all, but don't worry. Like I lived a great life. Yeah. I got to see you become who you were going to be. I got to, you know, marry your mother and write a book and help people as a doctor. And I can just list off all these things that I've been lucky enough to have in my life. So I think if they're old enough, starting that conversation is important. But above and beyond, your kids really learn from watching you do what you do. Yeah. So like, be a purposeful, interesting person and you'll be amazed at how resilient your kids end up being. Mm, that's so good, man. All right, back to your story. So seven-year-old uh, Jordan Grummet decides I'm going to be a doctor someday to right the wrongs of you know, the loss of my dad. Is that what happened then? Yeah, mm -hmm. and it was a tall order. I had a learning disability. I was like three or four grades behind all oh, the other wow. kids. I was a dorky kid with not many friends. I wasn't good at sports. I failed at pretty much everything I tried for the first probably 10, 15 years of my life. Mm. But I was so certain that I was meant to take my father's place that I got over it. I had a, I had three tutors at one point, so I got over my learning disability. I studied like a madman. I went to college, and when everyone else was out at the University of Michigan at the football games on Saturday morning, I was in the law library studying. But it worked. Like I was able to become a doctor just like my dad, which was really invigorating and exciting until I actually had to do the thing <laughs> long term. And instead of being joyous, I burned out like the paperwork and mm. the unhappy patients and the dream of rushing in and saving people, what every kid thinks of as being a doctor. Being a doctor is a lot more mundane. It's a lot of trying to get people to take their medic medications on a regular basis. It's a lot of things going wrong. The human body is incredibly complex. And unfortunately, especially over the last few decades, it's also a lot of paperwork. Like yeah. I spent huge amounts of time doing paperwork or sitting on the computer. The studies actually bear this out. 
new doctors spend like 80% of their time in front of the computer and only 10 to 15% of their time in front of patients. That's shocking. So the practice of medicine had changed and it no longer felt like the thing I thought I was supposed to do. You know, I think that happens to a a lot of people in that they have this goal set out there. I'm going to build a real estate business. I'm going to get financial freedom. I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to whatever. And then they, they fight so hard for that thing. And then they get it and it's like, well, it's not, it's not like I thought it would be, or maybe it was like they thought it was going to be for a short time. And then I don't know if it's the hedonic treadmill or whatever. It just becomes, oh, that's not enough anymore. Uh, how do we, how do we not, what have you learned about that? How do we not have that happen? I don't think you can stop that from happening. Actually. I think, you know, you never know what the thing is until you're doing the thing. Yeah. And in fact, you tell people training to be a doctor, don't do it. You're going to have tons of paperwork. It's going to be horrible. You're not going to feel like you're helping people. And they will look at you and say, yeah, well, that might have been you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's not going to be me. Yeah. I think the better question is how do you learn to pivot and not spend a full career doing Ooh. those things that don't serve you? Yeah, that's that's powerful, man. I mean... Yeah, so many people will spend 10, especially older generations. I think our generation is a little better at it. Younger is even better than that and maybe worse at that where you don't like something for a week, you quit your job and walk away, right? But there is a, there is a you know, my parents' generation, my dad cut meat for 40 years, stood up every day at the same store and cut meat. And that was just what he did, even though he didn't like it. Um, so there's a balancing act in there, right? Saying, hey, like I'm going to stick through it long enough to just know if this is really my, my thing, but not being afraid to say I'm going to pivot. I think we have to realize there is nothing wrong with doing hard work, even work you don't like, Mm. in order to accrue wealth, make money, support your family, et cetera. But if you're going to do that, you better do that with an eye of this is how this is serving me to do the deeper, more important things. Yeah. Like this is how I'm going to use this sacrifice so that I can spend more time with my family, pursue my hobby on the weekends. Whatever that may be, that thing that lights you up, you want to keep that in mind. And once you do that, you then can parse out. Some people are going to say, you know what? I'm not willing to sacrifice. I'm willing to take a job where I live in my passion and I make half as much and I'll make do. I'll eat less. We'll get secondhand clothing. We'll do whatever we have to do. That's what's important to me. Whereas another person will say, you know what? I'm going to grind it out for 10 years doing something I don't like. And we're going to save like mad people. and We're going to buy real estate, we're going to buy index funds. And then once we hit a place and I've sacrificed for these 10 years, then I'm going to quit my job and do whatever the heck I want. Mm. It's okay. Like none of those decisions are bad. The problem most of us have is that we don't actually think deeply about any of it. We just get on the treadmill and start running and we start measuring ourselves on how much money we have and whether it's enough. And that totally becomes a mirage that blinds us to actually looking at what we want out of life. Money's a tool. It's supposed to help us get something that's more important. But we somehow make money the most important thing and then forget to look past it. That's powerful. I see that in real estate all the time, man, where people, like, they have this number. I mean, I shoot, I did it, right? Like, I remember saying, if I could just make $3,000 a month, like, that would make me happy. That would, and, and I don't say those words, but that was a feeling, right? My subconscious said, if I can make 3000 a month, I'd be there. That's like, that's what I need. And I, and then I did that. And I'm like, oh, man, five grand would be great, right? And then it was like 10. And I am, I have a better life today than I did 20 years ago, for sure. Uh, as a multimillionaire, I can do really cool stuff and I live in amazing places and have good stuff. Uh, but I'm not, I'm a hundred times richer today than I was you know, 20 years ago. I'm not a hundred times happier. Uh, I might be equally happy. In fact, maybe in some ways I'm less happy. Uh, I, again, I have a better life, but I'm not necessarily more happy. When my wife and I were living in this little crappy duplex in the alley, like that was that was joyful times, you know? And it's, uh, yeah, it's easy to get caught up on that, uh, on that belief that you just have to make a little bit more and we're going to keep moving the goalposts forever. Uh, what I suspect is in your life, whatever increases you've had in joy or happiness or even purpose have come not from an increase in cash flow, but an increase in wisdom. Mm. And so you get to this point where increases in money just don't bring that much more into your life. Yeah. And so those of us who are really introspective and thoughtful pivot and say, okay, what does bring happiness in my life? 
those who are afraid to start thinking about purpose and those other types of things do exactly what you talked about. They just create a bigger goal. They're like, yeah. well, 3,000 was my goal. I hit 3,000. I don't feel any happier or more full. Let's make 5,000 the goal. Yeah. And so they just keep doing it. And it yep. becomes this treadmill that they could never get off. That's one group of people. The other group of people get to 3,000 a month and then they become panicked that something's going to change that all of a sudden one of their units is gonna go unrented and they won't be making that 3,000 a month anymore. So that's loss aversion and they get doubly worried yeah. that they're gonna fall back down, even more worried than they were that they wouldn't get there in the first place. The point is both of those are a recipe for not being happy. Yeah, well, let's go back to your story then. Uh, you became a doctor, realized this wasn't what I, you know, was I cracked up to be. I'm doing all this paperwork now. Uh, what did you do about that? Did you just quit then and go live under a bridge? I made the classic <laughs> mistake. I, I didn't go live under the bridge. Thankfully, okay. <laughs> I've been better off than that. But I made the classic mistake. I'm like, okay, being a doctor is no longer my purpose and identity. Let's make making money become my purpose and identity. And mm. I started thinking about, well, how can I make enough money to get out of the situation I'm in? And then I started spending all this time saying, well, how can I increase my income? How can I change my practice? How can I do medical side hustles, ways of making more money? And that, again, lasted for a while until I read a book by Jim Dolly called The White Coat Investor. He had sent it to me because I was writing a medical blog at the time, and he wanted me to review it for his blog. And he did a really good job of laying out what enough looks like, at least financially, and what financial independence is. And so I had this epiphany. I'm like, I am financially independent. I could walk away today from this job that is no longer fulfilling me. In fact, it's making me miserable. And I was so excited for minutes <laughs> and then i had a panic attack oh geez because i realized if i walked away from medicine i had no sense of self or Ooh. identity or purpose like i was the guy who was meant to be a doctor from childhood and then i became the guy who made a lot of money and both those identities i thought were important until i looked at my life and i said this just isn't serving me like it wasn't that i was unhappy because i've always been an optimistic person but I had this deep, enduring feeling that I wasn't living the life I was meant to live. And it was reflected in the way I acted. You know, most people are so proud when they get their degree and become a doctor. I was afraid to tell people what I did for a living. I would go to parties mm. and people would be talking about what they did for a living. And I would wince at the idea that someone was going to ask me because I, in a sense, felt shameful. And it took me a long time to realize, well, why am I feeling shame the reason was this identity I was wearing like a cloak on my outside didn't fit my inside. I wasn't that on the inside and I felt false. I felt fake. Mm, that's rough, man. So yeah, the identity thing is interesting. I, I know a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of real estate investors, but especially entrepreneurs who will sell their company mm. and then they don't know what to do with themselves anymore because their identity was, I'm the CEO of this company. And all of a sudden they make two, three, five million dollars and they're like, Oh shoot! I don't. And then don't they buy it that. back. And then, yeah, yeah, exactly. And they, they buy their company buy back. back. That's like, so common, yeah, actually. Yeah. Especially in the blogging world, we've seen that a lot. The financial yep. independence mm -hmm. blogging world, mm -hmm. people buy their stuff back because they don't know what else to do with their time. So what? What's? I mean, what's the answer then? What did you do? I mean, how did you find that identity and pur purpose again? So I had the same problem that these CEOs have. I was lost. I think the thing I did right is I realized I couldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I was lost enough to know that I couldn't walk away from being a doctor because I didn't know what to fill in that time yet with. So instead, I use something that in the book I call the art of subtraction. Mm. I just said, well, what do I hate most about being a doctor and got rid of it? And over the next few years, I pared back everything I did. I got rid of nights. I got rid of weekends. I got rid of being on call. And what I was left with was the one thing in medicine I would still do even if I wasn't being paid for it. And so I knew that it was important to my sense of purpose. And that was hospice work. Mm. So in a sense, I had to pare down being a doctor, find the kernel of purpose there. But that wasn't going to, I didn't want to be a full-time hospice doctor. So I knew I could do this 10, 15 hours a week. That was the beginning. But then I had to start the difficult process of trying to figure out, well, what else feels like purpose in my life? I now have 35, 40 hours extra a week to do whatever I want. And I thought deeply about my life and I realized that there were these things, there were these inklings or these callings that I had always had and I kept putting off. Like I've always wanted to be a writer. I started blogging in 2002 and I would do it in the spare hours at lunchtime or when mm. my kids were sleeping. But I had always told myself, well, you can't make a living doing this. This is not something you do. Being a doctor is what you do. This is just a hobby. But now that I have all that time, I'm like, well, maybe it doesn't have to be a hobby. 
And even if it's a hobby, maybe that's something that's really worthwhile to pursue during my free time because it feels deep and abiding and important. You know, there's a, that's a, a novel concept for a lot of people, myself included, who are ingrained in the, either the fire movement, the financial independence, real estate investing, wealth, whatever. It's such an absurd thought that I could do something that doesn't make money. Right. Like I have this problem where I constantly think everything I do, I'm like, well, duh. I mean, painting, that's probably silly because it doesn't make me money, money. <laughs> it's like, what, what if we did things that didn't make money purely for the love of doing things? And that's a, that's a hard thought. You know, Pete Aidney, Mr. Money Mustache, is kind of famous for bringing up the idea of water. He's like, if you don't have water, water seems incredibly important. But in modern day society, you can go anywhere and get water. Do you think about water every day? Are you worried about whether you have enough water to live, to survive? Arguably, water is more important than money. Yeah. So why do we spend so much time worrying about having enough money when a lot of people who are conscientious enough to have investments, like the kind of people who are listening to us right now, conscientious enough to have some investments, to think deeply about their finances, those people tend to generally die with too much money. Yeah. So why do we not worry about water, something arguably more important, and yet we worry about enough when it comes to money obsessively to the point where the idea of doing something that doesn't make money is anathema. I would tell you that people who live full and purposeful lives take a look at their daily schedule and say, I do almost all this without making money. They make money doing it. But if your schedule is full of things you wouldn't do if you weren't being paid for it, then you really need to take a hard look at your life. Mm. And if that's the case, it better be that you're doing those things to make money that allows you to do other things that are deeply important to you. Because if you're just doing it to do it, you are wasting the thing that we have zero control over, which is time. Time's going to pass no matter what you do. It's not a commodity. And once it's gone, it's gone. The only thing you have control over is what activities you are busy doing as that time passes. I don't know about you, but I want to be doing things that are purposeful for as much of that time as possible. Mm. And That's you found hospice then. Huh. How does somebody find that purpose that you call almost mission? I'm sure you've heard that the the story about the the three workers you heard that one where there's like the first one they ask hey what do you some guy walks by and they're all working on something he's like what are you doing he's like oh i'm moving bricks and the second guy's like well what are you doing he's like i'm i'm building a church and the third guy's like i'm working for god and it's like you know it's the same same they're all doing the same thing but they each have a different purpose of why they're like how do you find your your deeper purpose uh with what you should be doing with your life so this is one of my favorite questions and to do it i'll I'll talk for a moment about the life review which is something we do in hospice Mm. but before i even get there The truth is, I think most people have an inkling of what their purpose is. They're just too afraid and they don't have the courage to pursue it. Mm. So here are a few simple ways to think about what purpose means in your life above and beyond doing a full life review. One is what caught your attention when you were a kid? Like kids before society tells them they have to make lots of money before their parents tell them they have to be a doctor or a firefighter or a pro NBA player, whatever it is, kids have an innate idea of what lights them up. But somehow we lose that over time. Mm. So think about your childhood and what lit you up then. That's one way. Two, look at your job. You hate your job. Find the one thing about your job you do like. For me, that was hospice. But usually there's something in your job you like and then start asking your question, why do I like this? What is it about doing this thing that I like that takes this job, which otherwise is horrendous, but I ignore doing other things because I want to spend more time doing this part? When was the last time you woke up in the middle of the night and couldn't fall back asleep because you had a big, crazy idea? It happens to all of us. We all have this. What generally happens? Well, you, you go to bed late at night, you wake up the next morning tired, you've got work, and you forget about it, and you Mm -hmm. never think about it again. But these are those kind of whisperings of what's important to us. What if you pursued that idea as silly and outrageous as it was? What if you learned about it? What if you found other people who did stuff like that? And then one other thing I guess I should also mention is lastly, if you have no other idea, you use the spaghetti method. You throw a bunch of spaghetti up against the wall and see (laughs) what sticks, right? So you say yes to things you normally wouldn't do. Like... I normally wouldn't get on a plane to come to Maui to be interviewed for a podcast. On the other hand, being here, walking these beautiful beaches, 
swimming with Alex, <laughs> going to an undisclosed place, doing <laughs> undisclosed things which we can't talk about last <laughs> night. We signed an NDA. <laughs> True. All of that looks a hell of a lot like purpose to me. Mm. And I wouldn't have even thought of doing it unless I just started trying things that scared me, that were insecure yeah. and unknown. So after yeah, doing all so that, you can do something called the life review. Life review. And that's something you do in hospice, you said. Let's, it is. Let's talk about that. It is a structured series of questions that a doctor or a nurse or a social worker or a chaplain can sit down with someone who's dying and it helps them look at their life and talk about those important things. Like what were their goals? What did they accomplish? What did they fail to accomplish? Who are those important people in their life? What do they still hope to accomplish now that they know they're dying? Mm. It's a way of putting your life in perspective and it also allows us to start thinking about what are some of those regrets? Like what are those kind of things that we really wanted to do that we didn't do? And when you look at this under the lens of I could be dying, it allows you to let go of societal norms. It allows you to let go of all those things people told you you should be. And for once in life, you can just look at your naked thoughts and needs. And so that is a boon to the dying. The question is, why don't the living take mm. advantage of the same boon? Why aren't we doing these life reviews at a much earlier age? Not when we're dying, but we're at, when we're at a crux in our life or when we're starting a new job or when we just got that big bonus and we realize we have a little more money in the market than we thought we had after we buy our fourth door and realize that the money coming in can pay for my monthly needs. Why aren't we doing these life reviews and saying, it's time to think about what's really important to me. That's really good. And in your book, I know you had a uh, you have a practice in here. Uh, I don't know what page it's on, but where you you give the questions that people can actually do and take time out of their day to go do it. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to doing that because yeah, it's something that we don't look at enough. We don't. So let me let me pivot that a little bit. As a hospice doctor, you know, there's that famous book about the top five regrets of the dying. For anywhere. Yeah. What have you though, as a doctor, seen as the biggest regrets of those who are dying? Generally, it all boils down to the fact that they never, they always regret that they never had the energy, courage, or time to do something that was deeply important to them. Mm, so it's that never, purpose thing. it's never one thing specifically because individuals are different. Yeah. So we get excited by different things. But ultimately, when you talk to people who are dying, you realize that there was something they wanted to do that they just never got around to, or a person that was important to them that they never mended an argument a hobby that just lit them up and they let go and never return to. I mean, each person it's different, but the regret is that they didn't have the courage to pursue it. And, you know, a key point here is the regret is never that they failed because mm. people go and fail things all the time. It's the whole arena speech, right? Yeah. We've all heard the arena speech. Yeah. The regret is that you didn't get in the arena and fight the valiant fight. Yeah. Not whether you succeeded or failed. In fact, a lot of times people's fondest memories are right when they were in the arena, sweating it out, bleeding on their knees, and yet still fighting. I love that perspective. You know, there's, there, there's a thought often that says like, you know, will I, you know, five years from now, will I regret, well, let's even go more simple. Am I going to regret going to the gym later today? No one ever regrets going to the gym. They regret not going to the gym. And so I use that same methodology when I say like, will I regret not taking that trip. Uh, and sometimes it says, no, I, I would not regret not taking that trip. I would regret missing my kids because I took that trip, right? So that question of, will I regret this? And we can't always have perfect clarity, but I find that super as a, a super helpful framework in my life to say, should I do this thing or should I not do this thing? Should I pursue it? And most of the time, yeah, I, I would regret not taking the opportunities unless it takes away another more important opportunity that's valuable to me. And I'd remind people like, we talk about bucket list items and people are like, I regret that I didn't take, the, take that big trip to Europe. Yeah. Those things are not nearly as enduring as the regrets about living how you wanted to live. Mm, can you explain that more? Well, when we think about taking the trip to Europe, let's say, what we're really saying is we wanted to spend time with those important people or we wanted to get out of our environment and see different things or we wanted to contemplate how another portion of the world lives. What I often stress to people is to look at the deeper reasons and not the bucket list item itself. Because mm. usually it's the deeper reasons. You're not going to make it to every country you want to make it to, or most people don't. You're not going to actually tick off every bucket list yeah. item. But if you're really thoughtful about it, you can live a life of purpose that made you want to do those things. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, because you won't. like you, Your bucket list 
Like, I'm curious your thoughts on the bucket list. I like the idea of, of having that, like, I want to go to England or I want to go to the, see the pyramids. And I've got lists like that around. But there's this book, is it called 40,000 Weeks? Oliver Berkman, is that his name? Do you know yeah, the book yeah, I'm talking yeah. about? Yep, is yep, it 40,000 yep. Weeks or 40 something? How many you get with your family? Uh, sort of, but it's, it's not, it's about like, I think it's the, the name comes from like how many hours of like life you have or something like that. It's Oliver, Oliver Berkman. See like if you can look that up. 40,000 hours or something. Yeah. Something like that. See if you can yeah. look that up. Oliver Berkman's, yeah, Alex is going to look it up real quick. Uh, wow. I feel like Joe Rogan. <laughs> hey, Google that real quick. Uh, 4,000 weeks. 4,000 weeks. Uh, time management for mortals. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, he makes this amazing point in there. He said, if you were to think about all the things that are cool in this world and then realize you will not do point zero zero one percent of them i have a book in my house called a thousand places to see before you die it's this great coffee table book and then i open it up to like hawaii like the section of hawaii and there's like one thing in hawaii that's worth that's on the list of a thousand things to do there are a thousand things in kihei that are mind-blowing that i want people to do here's the problem with bucket lists yeah it's very goal and destination focused yes Happiness comes from purpose and process. Mm. Happiness comes from being engaged in as much of your limited time as possible doing things that are important to you. It's not based on a goal or destination. So when you start looking at bucket lists, what you're really talking about is all or nothing, win or lose. I either made it there and did that thing or I didn't. And what I don't like about those things is they are eminently failable. Mm. And so people get anxiety about purpose, yep. right? One of the reasons they get anxiety about purpose is they go after things that are goal-oriented. I, I love goals. And I, you know, writing a book was a goal for me. There's nothing wrong with that. But you want to base most of your purpose and happiness in things that you enjoy the process doing because you can't fail. Mm. It's not all or nothing. It's all and all. That's really good. All right. So l- let's, let's go a little deeper on this. It's easy to say as a doctor, somebody who makes a lot of money, that, yeah, you should just go pursue your passion, do something that was, is really great, right? And as me, a real estate investor, great, he makes millions of dollars, it's great, go go, you know, play on, in surf. What does that look like to the average person who's maybe in a job right now they don't love? They're making 40K a year, 50K a year, whatever that number is, and they're struggling. They can't just go and do what they want and, and frolic in the ocean. Like, what, what does that look like tangibly? Listen, I know I came from a place of privilege. Like I realized I was financially independent and then I could do all these things. I say, oh, just subtract out the things in your life you don't like doing. I realize Mm -hmm. that that's not that easy. But I think the mistake a lot of people make when they say, well, it's easy for you is they think that money is the only tool that helps you live the life you want to live. And Mm -hmm. the truth of the matter is we have a lot of tools at our disposal and there are going to be times in your life when you actually have less of the money and more of the other tools. I like to bring up the example of someone who's in their 20s, right? Like you said, they're grinding it out. They're making 40 or 50,000 a year. Maybe they don't like their job. Maybe they need that job to put money on the table. But if you start thinking about what other tools they have available to them, I'm 50 years old. When I was 20, I had more energy. I had more time. I wasn't married. I didn't have kids yet. We forget those kind of tools. So when you're in your 20s and you're working eight to six and you hate your job and you're working Monday through Friday, it's easy to get discouraged and be like, there's no way out. But I'd suggest, let's start looking at those other tools. Let's look at some of your passions and some of your time and your energy. Maybe on a given Sunday night, once a week, you spend three hours doing something you're passionate about, something that feels like purpose to you. And let's say you have an eye on making some money doing this and do that for six months not not failing at all. Every Sunday, you're going to sit down and do something you're passionate about for three hours that might make some money. And at the end of six months, let's see what happens. If you do make some money, maybe that's something you can build on. Maybe you can take your eight to six and make it a nine to five. Maybe you can work four days a week instead of five. Maybe you can build some margin in your life and start replacing that time you don't like doing things like work with things you do like doing, like that passion side mm. hustle. That's if you make money. Let's say at the end of six months, you didn't make any money. Well, what did you do? You took a life that was miserable in the sense that you didn't like being at work from eight to six every Monday through Friday, but you all of a sudden created three hours a week where you were doing something that felt purposeful and you were passionate about, even if it didn't make money. And I think that's the goal and we lose sight of this goal. The goal is not to make a lot of money. The goal is to realize that we have a limited amount of time on this earth and time is not a commodity. It passes no matter what you do. You have no control over it except 
that you do have a modicum of control over what activities you do during that time. So by taking those three hours a week and doing something purposeful, you've all of a sudden have a plus three in your week yeah. that you didn't have before. And so the goal, especially if you're feeling stuck, is how do I create more of those plus threes and hopefully find some way to build a little bit of financial margin so that you can then start subtracting out the negatives, right? If you have yeah. a negative 40 hours a week, you got to keep on adding more of those plus threes and getting rid of those negative hours. And that may look different for different people. For one person who's 22, that might mean leaving the United States and living in a cheaper country. For someone else, it might be that they get married and share an apartment and all of a sudden their apartment costs go down half. Yep. For another person, it might be investing in real estate and getting their first door and creating a little bit of margin with a touch of cash flow. There are a million different ways to do this, but you can't do it unless you start realizing that money is just one of your tools and you start utilizing those other tools to build margin. Did you know one example of this uh, when I look at my own life? And actually, it happened multiple times. But you know, I was working a job I didn't like, which was a group a group home overnight, taking care of de developmentally disabled adults. Uh, it was somewhat meaningful work, but it was an overnight job, and it was pretty miserable. Uh, so then I started investing in real estate, just on the side, no money, just started flipping houses. Right? I wasn't make. I really didn't even make anything on the first. I don't know, several years of real estate, but I was so into it. It was like purpose. Like that's what, I was, even though making no money, I loved every second of it. Even like the underneath the house, put up insulation, getting like bitten by, you know, bugs under the house. Like I just, I loved every second of it for whatever reason, which is super weird. It just, it appealed to me and I just kept leaning into it. And it took years and years of real estate to really start making money. I mean, I didn't make money flipping houses for the first maybe five years of actual, like made a profitable flip because the market was crashing and all that. But then in there, at one point, I took a job at a bank and I worked there for a year during that because I just couldn't sell anything in real estate. And I hated that job. That was like the classic example of a job I just could not stand. Every second of the day, I'm looking at the clock like 901, 902. And then one day, a year into it, they asked me to paint their break room because they're just like, hey, can you know how to paint? Can you paint the break room? And so I was like, sure. So I took a day and I painted the break room and I quit that day, that night, because it was the best day of work I'd ever had. And I found a purpose. I was like, oh, my purpose is that. So I quit. I went, jumped out and I became a contractor for a little while while flipping houses. And I, just, I again, I, I didn't really make money in contracting either because I wasn't good at any of that stuff, like business side. But I found purpose in that. And I just kept tweaking it until finally I discovered at one point, hey, I'm actually pretty decent at teaching. So I started teaching and then we started a podcast and that's what led to the Bigger Pockets podcast. Wouldn't have known that if I wouldn't have stuck that spaghetti to the wall and found what's stuck. Now to shift another really good example of this, actually our, our famous Alexander the Great here, uh, when it comes to your photography, right, Alex? So Alex is in the room here and uh, yeah, you got your camera and you started that, what, 10 years ago? I don't know, like a little less, yeah. Yeah, a little less than 10 years ago. You Again, you, you were making no money. Like what, what inspired you to just pick up a camera in, oh, I not, say this yeah. all the time. I've been telling you this story for like, since we met five years ago. Somebody in life told me you need three hobbies to make life simple, to make life, to solve life. You need three hobbies. Mm -hmm. One that makes you money, one that keeps you in shape, one that keeps you creative. Mm -hmm. And I had never called for 30 years. I'd said, I'm not creative. And so I was like, oh, something, maybe I'll go cameras. Mm -hmm. Seem, I picked it up and it shows me. Like, mm -hmm. I. I wish it made more money. It doesn't. I, it doesn't make more money. But I don't get that choice. <laughs> no, but what's cool is you you used the camera for years and made no money, just purpose only, right? You were helping, donating time to Bigger Pockets conferences and all that. And at some point, you got good enough. You you added video in there. And you started doing really good video, volunteering again for Bigger Pockets, making all those videos, uh, and maybe made a tiny bit of money. And then one day, I was like, Hey, Alex, you want to move out to Maui and build a nonprofit empire? And here you are today making loads of money, ridiculous sums of money. Everybody knows there's a lot of money in nonprofit. There's, there's, so, there's so, so much, so much. Money. There's so much money in nonprofit. But you're doing, you're now doing, you're getting paid now to do your passion. Uh, and you're, you're still doing some real estate. Yeah. But that's not your primary thing anymore. I, I'm glad not to be a starving artist. Yeah. I don't recommend that. That's not a good way, I don't think, to go through life personally. So I tell people like, because I know a lot of photographers now, I'm like, you have to learn the language of money so you can do, do it on the side. But yeah, I wish it was my purpose. I wish I was an entrepreneur like you. A lot of times, it doesn't, it doesn't fire me up. I'd rather hang out with entrepreneurs mm. and do and tell stories. Mm. You know what I love about your story, Alex? It really drives home this idea that when you start pursuing purpose, and a lot of times we do it and we're not making money. Yep. But what we are doing is we're filling our time with activities we enjoy. People see you at your best. They see you lit up and yeah. excited. And whether you mean to or not, you create connections and community 
And that's what all this is for, right? You hear me all the time talk about purpose, identity, and connections. The truth of the matter is, the end game is not how much money you have, and it's not financial independence. The end game is actually community and connections. And you know what's really, really cool? A lot of times if you figure out purpose and identity and build a stable financial framework, like how you did with real estate, the connections and community will come. Mm. It's the most important thing, and yet the one that you have to work on least if you do the others well. Yeah, that's powerful, man. We have a thing out here. I, I don't, maybe I shouldn't talk about this, but I will. We have the Maui Cool Kids text thread. Maui cool like, kids. The Maui Cool Kids. We, I think this is your idea, actually. Alex yeah. started this thread of just friends of ours that are into real estate that live here in Maui in our neighborhood. And there's like, I don't know, 25, 30 people in this group now. Disclaimer to our Maui <laughs> friends that are in Better not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not everyone in the group. Sorry. Ask Alex to be put into the group. It's actually almost all people who go to Hope Chapel. So like, we, we started this thing at church one day after church, just hanging out with our kids on the playground. But like, we'll just post in there like, hey, headed to the beach, which costs zero dollars. And by the way, anybody can do this. It's not like a Maui thing. We just post like, hey, headed to the beach or headed to this park. And then there'll be 15 people will show up at the park. And all of a sudden we, I mean... We have hung out with somebody in this group. I've hung out with somebody in this group and with you almost every day for a month now. I mean, barely a day goes by that we're not in community with deep connection with people that I'm just like, it's like Diedrich Bonhoeffer, a famous old guy who ended up getting killed by the Nazis, wrote a book called Life Together. Uh, and it's all about this idea of like humans are meant to live in community and connection with one another. Uh, and we have lost that and it doesn't cost anything. However, real estate brought us together to your point. And, We're all and, in the real estate. You know, real estate is great. There are a small group of people who love real estate so much they would do it even if they weren't making money for it. I'm probably in that group. And, and, <laughs> and, and I, I believe Brandon is one of those people. But for those people who don't love real estate that much, it is a fantastic way to build a financial framework yes. to give you the freedom and time to do the things you want to do. In fact, I have trouble thinking of something. If you have the courage, yeah. the courage to learn about real estate and own a property and start taking care of things. It is one of the few things that probably anyone could do yeah. and build enough of a financial framework to free them up to start doing whatever they wanted, whether they make money or not. Now, I will tell you, most people I know, when they truly pursue purpose and find things they love, they do create those connections and community and they end up teaching or consulting yeah. or creating content. It just naturally flows. But the fantastic thing is if you have a great financial structure, maybe something like real estate, it doesn't matter if it does or not. It's just one more thing you don't have to worry about. Yeah, that's really powerful, man. Hey, I want to go back a little bit to your story of working in hospice. And I'm going to shift gears here and go a different direction, but I'm, I'm curious. Uh, in general, what was it like working with people that knew they were about to die uh, were they happy? Were they sad? Were they miserable? Uh, wh where were they at in that? Uh, and, and how did you then help them through it? So I often say that generally people tend to die the way they lived. So you mm. want to know how someone's going to take a terminal diagnosis? Look how they took all the ups and downs in their life. Yeah. People who are anxiety and depression ridden tend to be anxiety and depression ridden when they find out they're dying. And people who are happy, go lucky and optimistic tend to be like that during death too. There are a few things I am lucky enough to get to do as a hospice doctor. One is I am an expert in controlling symptoms. So I get to give them the pain medicines, the nausea medicines, et cetera. We also get to help them be where they wanna be when they die. So people think hospice is a place, it's not. It's basically a theory Mm. It's a mode of treatment, but we can do hospice in people's homes. We can do it in nursing homes. We can do it in hospitals. We can do it in hospice units. Um, so it's a modality, not a place. And then we can help them deal with the process of dying. Like we help thousands of people die every year. So when people ask, is it going to hurt? What's it going to feel like? How do I come to terms with my life and what I've done and what I won't be able to do. Those are all things that we help people. The hospice team is, as a doctor, I actually do little compared to the nurses, the certified nursing assistants, and then we have chaplains and social workers. The whole idea is to be in a sense of full service for people who are going through something that scary and unknown. Well, you, you asked the question, I'm gonna ask you then, does it hurt to die? So here's my experience. Generally, we've gotten good enough at the medicines 
that it generally isn't. In fact, dying 90 to 95% of the time is fairly quiet and peaceful. Um, but as I said, you know, some people live lives that aren't very quiet and peaceful, and those people tend to have not quiet and peaceful deaths. There are certain diseases which are a little bit harder to control than others, um, but we are much better at the medicine. So mm. I would say it's a rarity that people look actually uncomfortable when they die. Um, yes, there's end of life agitation and confusion, which sometimes family members look and say, oh, they're in pain. They're not, they just have terminal agitation. People get confused. Um, I can tell you very clearly that since doing this job, I have zero fear of the dying process. Mm. Like that's one thing that I've learned from being in the room with people as they die. Like that no longer scares me. Wow, man. So where does the connection come between the the dying and your work with them in hospice and personal finance? Like what does that have to do with each other? So I tell people that I'm a personal finance expert and a hospice doctor and they look at me kind of funny. Yeah. It has everything to do with it. And the reason why is the dying have the clarity to look past the idea of money as something they need specifically and can concentrate on what's important in their lives and what they want to accomplish in the time they have left. And so the lens of looking at their life without worrying about what society tells them they should be, what their parents tell them they should be or their family tells them what they should be, just the ability to see life as it actually is, mm. is exactly what often we need when we're looking at our personal finances. It's so easy to get caught up in the numbers and making a living that we forget that the idea behind making money is that it is a tool to realize our deeper goals. But most people never think about that. On the other hand, the dying are all about their deeper goals. Did they accomplish them? Did they spend their time appropriately to reach those goals? And if there's any time left, can they get an inch closer to where they want to be? If we do this right, we can take that personal knowledge that the dying have and start applying it to ourselves and start building a financial life that actually allows for that. We almost need to be jostled and told, look, your money is a tool. It is not a goal. Dying with lots of money will not serve you. But dying in such a way that you used your money during your lifetime to do those things that felt deeply important and purposeful will. Mm. So how does this relate to, I'm going to bring up a concept you may have mentioned earlier, but the FIRE movement. What is the FIRE movement uh, and what are your general thoughts on it? So the FIRE movement is a financial independence retire early movement. And this was my introduction into personal finance. Actually, when I learned that I was financially independent, it was through the FIRE movement. The oldest iteration of the FIRE movement, probably from the early 2000s, although you can, you can look back and see people talking about financial independence in books from the 1900s or even sure. the 1800s. But the iteration that we're most familiar with was really a group of highly paid people who hated their jobs, who would do anything they could to save as much money as possible, spend as little money as possible, and get to a point where their net worth was high enough to then retire. And so that was the first iteration. And the problem with that is people ended up living these lives that were painful or difficult. They were denying themselves things yeah. they wanted and as much as I don't like YOLO, you only live once. Mm -hmm. Like my dad died at 40. If you spend all your time trying to get to this vaunted net worth because it's gonna allow you to be the person you wanna be, you may, one of two things, you may die early and never get there. Or what's even worse sometimes is that you may get there and realize you never actually thought about what all this was to do for you. So that was the yeah. original FIRE movement. And in a sense, my book is a little bit of a pushback against that. It's saying, well, let's stop looking at what FIRE gets us and start looking at how it can serve us better. Because what we found, and as the FIRE movement has actually evolved, a lot of people are starting to realize you don't actually have to get to that financial independence number per se to start living the life you want to live. The key is to start planning for it earlier. So there are all sorts of new kinds of fire, right? There's slow fi or there's coast fi. Mm. The idea of these movements is that instead of saying, I'm going to put off life till tomorrow so I can get to my number, I'm going to start thinking about how I want to live life today. 
And then maybe I decide that instead of retiring in 10 years, I'm going to retire in 30 years, but I'm going to go part time and spend half my day doing stuff I like doing. And the other half I'll spend doing work, which I may or may not like. But it's worth it for me now to start enjoying life using my financial knowledge, even using this idea of what the FIRE movement gets us, this financial freedom, but using it to design the lifestyle you want to live today. So yeah. it's evolved and it's really become a lifestyle design movement, but it wasn't when it started. And so there are a lot of people out there who would really live lives that were uncomfortable, right? Yeah. They would eat rice and beans. They would only travel to places they could go that were cheap. And when they were there, they would skimp on food and they would save until it hurt. And they would turn down the temp. Have you ever seen these memes about turning down the temperature in your house to yeah. like 65 yeah, and yeah. feeling uncomfortable? I think we've moved past that. But the original gist of the movement was a little too austere. And it didn't think enough about living the lives we want to live today. So it was all yeah. about putting things off. Yeah, the problem I've always had with like the financial independence, retire early, the FIRE movement, is simply that it's predicated on this idea of retire early. Like there's some answer yeah. in retirement, yeah. right? But this, I mean, I've, I've heard of studies, I wish I had the stats now, but like people die when they retire. Like there's kind of a moving they target, do. right? They yeah, so, so all of a sudden you're saying the goal of my life is to retire and die like that's not a good goal so you could you could try really hard and work a job you don't like for 20 25 years 20 years 15 if you're crazy 10 if you're insane retire early and then do what you want but then you're doing what you want on four percent of a million dollars and you live on 40 grand for the rest of your life fine but why not just today switch jobs to a job like that's what i love about what your message is that gives you purpose today you're like if any here, here's the truth about i found with financial independence Anybody I've ever known who is able to get financial independence cannot sit still enough to retire. Exactly. So they're going to work to the day they die, no matter what. Everybody's going to, like you said, you like you're you, you can't make time stop or slow down or anything. It's just it's going. So why not just start today doing a job that you're passionate about? And that brings back what we talked about earlier. Yeah. Let me blow the mind of anyone who is a hardcore fire person. The purpose of fire is to live a life of purpose, identity, and connections. It's to do the stuff that's meaningful to you. Yep. The grand majority of people can do the stuff that's meaningful to them and live a life of purpose without ever becoming financially independent. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's, it's a truth. And yep. in fact, in fact, most people will do that. So yes, the majority of people don't necessarily always live a life of purpose. Yeah. But those people who are interested in doing that, and there are tons of people out there quietly doing their jobs and loving it and not saving very much, and they will work until they're 65 or 70 yep. or 75, and they may at the end of life, maybe they will have a little bit less money than they wanted, but it is possible. And so the FIRE movement just confuses this idea that money is the thing that's the end product, whereas yeah. my book, and I think what all of us are saying is that the end product is the good life. Yeah. Money just supports it. Yeah, that's so good. You know, there's, there's a famous story. I know Tim Ferriss tells it at the end of the four-hour work week, and I'll, I'll bring it up here, but then I want to give a counter to it. The story goes, there's a, uh, you know, a, a guy, American businessman out on vacation down in Mexico, and he goes to this small little seaside town, and he sees a guy hauling in his fish, right, 10 in the morning. He's like, why aren't you out there longer? And the guy's like, well, I'm, I got enough fish for the day to feed my family. And he's like, no, 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 let me show you how to do this. You should go back out there again for three times a time, you know, the hours, get more fish, get more boats, eventually move to Mexico City, eventually get to New York, have a billion dollar empire, right? He goes on this long story. And the Mexican, uh, you know, fisherman just keeps saying, well, well, what next? What next? What next? And finally he gets to, well, then at the end of all that, you IPO, sell out, and you retire here on the beach in Mexico, and you go fishing till 10 a.m. to feed your family, right? And it's this great little story. And I've always loved that. In fact, it was on my, uh, my Facebook as like the image forever. Mm -hmm. And then I read, and I wish I remember what book it was. Somebody was like, like, no, that story is crap because what happens when the hurricane comes and his boat breaks down and now the guy can't feed his family and his kids die. It's like, that's the other side. So there's two sides here. There's the like, no, you should hustle until the day you die, making money and all you can possibly do to be wealthy. And then there's the like, I mean, I got friends that are like this. There's let's just, you know, eat, drink and enjoy life. Like why worry about the future at all? And it gets real bad for people like that during COVID or during, you know, we just had the fires here in Maui and there's hundreds of businesses that have nobody here on island right now to support them. And they are just, I mean, besides the many, obviously hor horrific stories of people dying, there's now hundreds of businesses that, yeah. that can't pay their employees. Those people are out of work and they're stuck and there's no government money coming from them uh, to help them. So where's the middle ground? How do you, how do you not obsess about money your entire life, but still, uh, 
not be stupid with it. So let me put that in another way. What you're really asking is how do we figure where we land on the YOLO versus deferred gratification yeah. continuum, yeah. right? So you only live once, which is spend everything and do whatever you want to do versus deferred gratification, which is you save, 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 save and never actually live life. Yeah. So here's my solution, what I talk about in the book. The problem is we don't know when we're going to die. If we knew when we were going to die, it's going to be 10 years, five weeks, and two days, I could parse out my spending to exactly match so yeah. that I did with what the great book says, die with zero, right? Yes, which is a great book. Unfortunately, yeah. we don't know we when don't that know. is. So what we need to do is we need to find another rational way to think about this. And so I ask people, well, what scares you most? Are you most afraid that you are going to die young and wealthy and never enjoy that wealth? Or are you afraid that you're going to die a really long life and run out of money? And if you can start thinking about that as a proxy to knowing when you're going to die, we can then look at your financial life and start making real decisions about how to spend today versus defer gratification for tomorrow. I always use my dad as an example of this, right? So my dad, if I had asked them that question, my dad actually knew he was going to die young. He told my mom this when he got married to her. Really? And so for my dad, he was afraid that he was going to die young and never really enjoy himself or use as well. So my dad made decisions very much predicated on that. Like when he got out of fellowship, he could have taken this big, expensive private practice job, but he knew he wouldn't like it as much. And he went to work for the VA, the veteran system, and made about half as much money. But he had more time to be with his kids and more time to do the things he liked in medicine. My dad loved photography. He loved travel. And he pursued all of these things. You know what he didn't do? He didn't save a lot for his retirement. I mean, he did all the important stuff. Like yeah. he got life insurance. He made sure we were all taken care of. He, in fact, pushed my mom to go back to school and get an MBA because he's like, what happens if I'm not here? But he wasn't worried about living a long life and not having enough. Me, on the other hand, I've always thought that I kind of live long and, and you know outlive a lot of the people I loved. So for me, I'm not as worried about not enjoying my wealth today. I wanted to make a lot of money, maybe even grind it out a little bit because I foresee a long life and I want to have lots of years to enjoy that wealth, right? I don't mm. want to run out too quickly. So if you play these scenarios out in your mind, you can actually start thinking about how we answer that question. How much do I spend today? If you were like my dad, maybe let's say you make $100,000 and 50 of it goes to your fixed cost. So you have 50 left over. If you're like my dad, you probably use 40,000 of that to YOLO. Live today, buy the most expensive camera, go on vacation. You take the other 10,000, you put it in savings, you invest it, whatever, in retirement savings. So let's play that out. Let's say you're right and you die young. Well, you kind of used your wealth to live a good life, to support the people you love, to do all the things you want to do. Let's say you're wrong. Well, if you're wrong and you live to 80, guess what? You're not going to retire at 40 or 50 or maybe even 60. But you know what? You've been using all that money to YOLO this whole time. So you can continue doing that. Save your 10,000, enjoy your 40,000, live life. It's not a bad life. Even yeah. if you have to work till 60 or 70, you're kind of doing what you want. Yeah. So either scenario works. Change it over. Let's say you're me and I'm worried that I'm gonna live to a really old age and I'm not gonna have enough money. So I would do the exact opposite. 50% goes to set expenses. I have 50,000 left over. I'm going to save 40,000 and use 10,000 to YOLO. Play that one out. Well, if I'm right, you know, I'm going to be able to retire early. I could stop maybe at 40 or 50 and live a really fat, wonderful life full of purpose, identity, connections, and do whatever I want. What if I'm wrong? Well, if I'm wrong and I die young, that's kind of the worst case scenario of all four. But at least I was using some money towards YOLO. I didn't think this was likely. Yeah. It was unexpected. But hey, I was using some money to do what I wanted. And the truth is I died with this dream that I was going to live this wonderful retirement. It's not that horrendous either. And honestly, you'll be, you'll be dead, so you, so, won't, even, you yeah. won't regret it. <laughs> you All won't this know. is also, though, predicated on the fact that no matter who, which of these people you are, you protect yourself. You get life insurance, sure. you get disability insurance. If you live in a place that's prone to natural disasters, you try to get the right insurance to yeah. cover you and your business, et cetera. Being smart is being smart, who, which, whichever one of these people are. So that's the only rational way I know to figure out that YOLO deferred gratification continuum because it's impossible. Unless you happen to know exactly when you're going to die, you're going to probably get it somewhat wrong. Yeah. But this is the best approximation I know of. I like that. And and you don't have to be all or nothing. I think people, humans tend to be like, 
Yeah, you have to be the person that doesn't eat. You know, who to- what, what, what's the analogy you use? They put their bread at the iron at the you know toast their bread on an iron at the hotel room, so they don't have to go uh, out to eat. Like you can be that person, which sounds terrible, uh, <laughs> or you could be. You know, yeah, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. It just says, hey, like, you know, my, my parents, I think, are a really good example. My dad and mom growing up, you know, they didn't make a lot of money. Dad, meat cutter. Mom did daycare in my house with a Dairy Queen for a little while. And they generally spent almost all of their money on vacations for our kids. Like, I mean, they, 95% of it probably, if it wasn't fixed expenses, went to vacation or stuff for us, activities, memory building things. They, they invested heavily in memories growing up. Now they got older and the, thankfully they bought some houses along the way, not real estate investing, just the house they lived in. And then it went up in value. And when you ha- buy a house and hold on to it for 30 years, I mean, you upgrade every five or 10 years, but they just got more and more equity. So now they at least have a, you know, a nice little chunk enough that their retirement with their 401ks and all that will be just fine. But my parents like invested in the memory and, and I love that idea that they didn't scrape and tell us we could never have new clothes, but they also weren't stupid. They bought a house, they invested, I mean, in their own real estate. And so I think, I think, uh, you know, I owe my parents a lot for that. And now like, you know, thankfully they got kids that make a lot of money and so we can take care of them. So they kind of got the best of both worlds, but we use these investing terms and we only tend to use them with investing, but we should probably use them with other things too. So your parents invested in memories and those memories compounded and paid dividends Mm, into a less regretful life. Yep. Right. So when they're on their deathbeds, if they have not died already, they're still here, they will be able to look back and say, I did do the things I cared about. I didn't put the money away just to put the money away and let, that season of my life passed me without enjoying the kids and the time together. Other things compound. Yes, money compounds and compounding is incredibly beneficial for building financial wealth. But our experiences, our love, our joy, all of that compounds too. And if you're skimping out on that early in life, you're gonna find yourself in trouble as you get older. Yeah, that's so true. Have you lost all your wealth today, all your money, all your wealth, medical license out the window? I don't know if something really bad happened to you. Uh, You're broke. You're starting over. What do you do? First of all, how long would it take you, do you believe, to become a millionaire again, a millionaire? And how would you do it? I think it would take me 10 years and undoubtedly I would do real estate. I don't know any other way to build wealth that fast. Mm. And I don't love real estate. I had a bunch of doors. I went through COVID. We had rats. We had cockroaches. We had tenants that were a pain in the ass. I did the typical went halfway and didn't really own being a landlord, et cetera. So I sold a lot of my real estate. But if I had nothing, it is the most powerful fastest way to build wealth, especially if you don't already have skills, right? So I have skills as a doctor. So if I can use my ability as a doctor, I could just go and be a doctor. I find a way. Um, I could be a writer and I probably could make a living in it, but it wouldn't be a great living. Real estate because of leverage is, I think, the fastest way to either be financially independent or become a millionaire, especially when you're starting from zero. I think when you're starting from a few million, it's really easy to make another million, right? Um, I don't see any other way that's that quick and easy. I agree. I always say real estate is the most, it's the fastest of the secured ways to build wealth, right? Like, yeah, you can start a startup and get lucky and sell it for $10 million and whatever. That's a one out of a thousand shot, most likely. But you do a decent job at real estate and you're halfway intelligent, a million dollars in 10 years, it'd be hard not to get that. You got to put in the work. Yes. You 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 do have to do it. like what I know now, I would have to do it much more aggressively than I did, but I know how to do that. I yep. just didn't because I was busy with other parts of life. I was yep. busy being a doctor and running a business and eventually pursuing my purpose and things that were really exciting to me. And so I didn't put the time in I should, but I know how to get there. And again, I, I think for someone who has zero money, I, don't, I can't think of anything more pow- powerful than that. Yeah. That's really good, man. I love that answer. That is a uh, social media <laughs> clip right there. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. I want to ask a few more here before we move on to the kind of the next segment. Should I leave? Here's a good one. Should I leave my kids my wealth? What do you think? What are you going to do? So the wealth that you leave your kids is the m- least important wealth building knowledge or tool you give them, right? So mm-hmm. what you leave them really are two things that are more important than the wealth you give. 
One is your modeling. So you can give your kids your wealth, but what really will make wealth for them is watching you, your successes and failures, and having the courage to then either duplicate them or create their own paths. That's one. The other thing is the thing that's going to make your kids most successful is giving them a safe place to fail when they're young where the stakes aren't as high. So if you want your kids to understand money, you have to allow them to make money decisions when they're young and those money decisions aren't as consequential, right? So they screw up with their allowance or they screw up with their yearly allotment of money that you give them. Nothing really bad's going to happen from that, but you go to college and you get a bunch of credit cards and you screw that up, the consequences are much more dire. So do you leave money to your kids or not? I think your kids will be happier if they build their own wealth. So instead of leaving them a huge lump sum, I almost think it's better to have a long-term plan or trust where that money disperses over many generations. Mm, so yeah. maybe you pay for their college. But there is something to be said for the self-reliance of building your own empire. And I think you really take something away from them by providing it for yeah. them. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah, I always I tell a story often, and people have heard it a million times, I'm sure. But uh, I like this story: is I I bought Rosie, my daughter, when she was a week old. We bought her a fourplex, mm -hmm. and we put it on a 15 year, basically a 15 year path plan. It was like 18 year path plan, so it'd be path to zero when she's ready to go to college. So we bought it when she was born. 18 years later, path to zero. It, it was probably worth 200,000, uh, maybe 150, 200,000 when we bought it. It should be worth 400,000 when we sell it 18 years later and guaranteed uh, covers a college, right? Yeah. That's a cool story. But I always end with the best part though is not the, the, the 400,000. I hope she doesn't go to college actually. I hope that lesson of that deal mm -hmm. makes it so she doesn't have to go to college. And that's the most valuable thing I can possibly do is sh show her the power of compounding and interest and, and payments you, and, and rent. And you modeled for her yeah. behavior that will be so much more important than the actual money that she ever yeah. derives from that. It's actually seeing you and those conversations you have with her through the years of, this is why we bought this. This is what it's gonna do for you. This is how it was worth 200,000, but it's worth 400,000 now. This is the amount of rent we're bringing in. All of those things, you're really modeling the type of behavior that's gonna serve her maybe more than college will. Yeah, the irony is of course, and why I love real estate sometimes is that today, seven years in, it's worth over $400,000. <laughs> and so it's like, now I'm in that question, I'm like, okay, well, should I just sell it now that the market's hot? But I don't think I'm going to because, I mean, I can sell it, I can stick the money into a, you know, a bank CD at 5% at this point and, you know, her college is already paid but for at this Think point. about how but powerful I want it her is to, learn. to bring her into that discussion of yes. what to do with it. Ooh, now. yeah, you're right. So yeah. all of a sudden, you've just taken a basic 101 course, and now you're bringing it to a 201 or 301 yep. course. And on just so many different levels, you're preparing her to be successful regardless of what happens to that actual property. Yeah. Yeah, I I love that idea. So, and I I preach that from the hill, uh, from the rooftop every every chance I can. It's like buy your kid a property when they're young, or like in their name, or not in their name physically, but just like in their honor. I guess so. It's still in my name. It's my mortgage, whatever. I'm just I'm using it for them. And uh, yeah, it's all about the lessons I can teach her. And so in her math homework growing up, like in, as a homeschooler, her math homework is starting this year is going to be running the numbers on her property. And we're gonna do the pluses and minuses and. It's a, uh, and that'll, every year she'll get better at doing the math, but every year she'll get better at knowing how to manage tenants and property managers and all that. So anyway, all right, we got to shift. We're going to move to the next section of the show, which I call the three, two, one pivot. So when I say pivot, I'm referring to the concept that your life is going one direction and then something happens that makes you change direction, maybe 1%, 5%, 20%, 100%, right? Your life changes on a dime. Uh, and that's what I mean by a, a, like a pivot moment. So I'm gonna start with, I wanna ask you three books that made you pivot your life. I call them pivot books. So three pivot books, two pivot people, and one pivot quote. So we'll start with the books, three pivot books. So I was really thinking about this, three pivot books. Um, when I was a kid, I read Herman Hesse's Siddhartha. Mm, I've not read it. And so Siddhartha is about the voyage to inner enlightenment and finding peace. And ultimately, the main character, Siddhartha, discovers Buddhism and finds that enlightenment has to come internally as opposed to externally. 
And so I think that that concept was something that hit me as a pretty young kid of, I can't find what I need out of this world from the outside. Like I have to figure out the inside first. Mm. I think that book had a big effect on me. Another one that I'm embarrassed to say had a big effect on me, but did is Atlas Shrugged, mm. Ayn Rand. Mm. I, the idea of self-reliance and creating what you want in the world and getting rid of excuses and you know being accountable to yourself and to your actions going back and reading it now like i see that there are lots of shades of gray that it completely misses sure. right there are a lot of things i don't like about it now but as a kid this idea that i had to be accountable for myself and my actions and my success or lack of it really stuck with me yeah. um and lastly a book that really affected me because of the art of writing something that i've always just been profoundly affected by was tony morrison's beloved Hmm. Like, I read that. I read. I've heard this so many times uh, about writing. Yeah. I Beloved. read Beloved huh. in a college course, and it was about maturity and writing. Huh. And we started by reading a book about World War II and Hitler, and it was a very ugly book that kind of went into detail of exactly what the Holocaust was like. And we transitioned from book to book to book till we ended with Beloved. And it was about how Toni Morrison used the art of writing to paint the picture of how horrendous slavery was without having to go there to the actual depictions of ugliness, mm -hmm. if I can explain it sure. that way. She used the art of telling a story. And I was profoundly, it was probably this professor who profoundly affected me, but it was reading that book and I just saw the power of the written word and what human creativity transformed into imagery through words can accomplish. And I'm like, I need to be able to do that at some point in my life. Probably not nearly as good, but I need to have that feeling. Yeah, that's so, so good. I'm going to pick that book up right away. Uh, yeah, when, when I think about writing, it's kind of off topic, but if when if I suddenly had a billion dollars today and I couldn't do real estate, which is a huge passion of mine, and maybe even even if I if I, you know, could do real estate, I really think like the number one thing in life I'd want to do is write. Like that's probably the mm -hmm. thing I, I feel most at like this is my purpose when I'm like writing. And I write maybe an hour a week right now. It's so little compared to what I want to cuz I'm in meetings and I'm in other, you know, making videos and stuff, but man, writing is yeah. When I, I just got finished reading a book a few months ago and there's two in the series. It's a fiction book kind of a um fantasy series called the name of the wind or the first one's called the name of the wind mm -hmm. but in reading that thing yeah i know have, have you read it yet no but i talk about it constantly <laughs> but how do you always describe it it's i don't know the best fiction book of all time it's like a dream uh, a pillow it's thing. like it's like reading butter yeah i think yeah, yeah it's like reading like popcorn for yeah it's just yeah it's a, it's so poetically and beautifully written every word every line every page i'm just like it one makes me very like moved to be a writer and I'm like I just want to be able to write that much and then it makes me sad knowing I could never write that good yeah that's you know, probably like beloved for you oh god yes and <laughs> you know one of the things that's always been hard for me is I realized that I was that at being a doctor mm. I was the best the thing I'm best at doing in life is being a doctor but it's not the thing that lights me up mm. it's writing interesting how screwed up is that <laughs> So you should do more writing. I do. Mm. And podcasting and yeah. public speaking. I actually sure. think they're all very similar. So, yeah, they really are. Um, you're creating kind of through words. That's good, man. All right. So those are their books. What about Pivot People? Pivot People. I, so I would say that I had a combined pivot person people in high school. I had a Spanish teacher who debated with us constantly in Spanish class. He made us speak Spanish too. He was a little bit more kind of right-wing conservative and I'm a little bit more left-wing liberal. And so we talk about abortion and we talk about all these kind of things, guns rights. And, and we'd have these talks in Spanish. And at the same time, I had a US history teacher who made us memorize like the first two paragraphs of the Declaration of Independence. Like mm. when in the course of human events it becomes necessary, when people dissolve wow. political bands that have blah, 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 right? And both of them were like these amazing models of people who loved learning and took things that 
felt like really boring subjects and brought them to life. Like when this history teacher told about U.S. history, he would jump around the room and he'd get right up in your face and say something and then he'd move on to someone else. And he just, you know, it was a performance every day. Uh, and it was so clear, his passion for doing this. And same with my Spanish teacher. Is he's, you know, he just wanted to engage the kids, these, you know, burgeoning minds yeah. and build them. And so I think I was very profoundly affected by having those two teachers the same year. Mm. Um have you ever gone back and thanked them? I haven't. Yeah. I'm not that kind of guy. I tend to leave <laughs> things and disappear and never yeah, come same, back. Like, same. So high yeah. school, I never go back. College, I haven't yep. gone back, et cetera. Um, so that, that, <laughs> I, I would call that like my, my first person, the two combined. The other real pivotal person, someone I don't know, when I started podcasting, I eventually worked with Joe Salcihai. He does the yep. Stag Benjamin's podcast, and he's – Partially owns or an invest. He's been kind of like a, a coach for me in podcasting. Yeah, he's a good dude. And he kept on saying to me, he's like, well, who do you want to sound like? Like, what do you want this to be? And I didn't have an answer because, you know, I, I make a podcast. I don't listen to lots of podcasts. And I finally realized who I want to be like. It's Terry Gross from NPR. Mm -hmm. Fresh air. Yeah. Like, I listen to her and I want to be a better interviewer. And... That, I think, was really a big point when I realized I actually had a blueprint for what I want to create. Yeah. Like, I want to have those deep type of conversations. I want to ask those leading conversations. I want to take as few words as possible that I ask and get you to reveal on mic your deepest secrets. And I think she does that. And, like, that's what I want to be. That's beautiful. You know, one of the kind of the model or framework inside of uh, the Better Life Tribe that we have, this uh, kind of nonprofit uh, mastermind, so to speak, is this idea that I teach all the time is if you want a better life, look at who already has what you want and then ask what they do. It's pretty simple, right? But we don't, we hardly ever take the time to do that. So I love that, uh, was it Joe asked you that? Yeah, it's is reverse like, engineering. Yeah. He's big on reverse engineering. Yeah. And that's exactly so who do you want to sound like? Yeah. What are they doing? Yeah. It's like so simple. So it's like, oh, I want to, I mean, even like, you know, I got, I got a buddy who runs a cleaning company and it's like, he's struggling with it. And I'm like, well, I'm going to bug him later. Actually, I'm like, who runs a cleaning company that you're, you admire? Like who, who's your competition that you actually admire? Like pick out a person. If you don't know, you're probably not networking enough. And then what are they doing? Like, how are they running their business any different? Who's an entrepreneur you look up to? I mean, Alex and I, we, we constantly talk about like what Chris Williams, is it Williamson? William, a like, podcast that yeah. we want to. I don't want to say emulate. Yeah, yeah. But, but we look at, they're the, they're the, I mean, like Jay Shetty just had on uh, Biden and Kardashian, yeah. Kim Kardashian. Like, yeah. I, I, what? Like, <laughs> not that I necessarily am going to want Biden or Kardashian, but how the heck did he get Biden and Kardashian in back-to-back -back weeks? Like, that's absurd. So what is he doing? Yeah. It's, yeah. Asking that question will change your life. All right, man. Uh, yeah. What was that, Alex? What, what are you saying? <laughs> Say it. Did man. you ask the charity question? Oh my gosh, that's a charity question. I forgot. Yeah. It wasn't even. Was it on my thing? It wasn't on my thing. I'll fix it. Oh, that's all right. Checklist. Uh, all right. It's not. It's my own fault. I even want to write this thing. Let me add that in. Uh, question for you. Every episode of this show, we donate all the profits from the ads to uh, a charity of the guest choosing. So what uh, breaks your heart? What would you like us to put the money toward? So there is a charity called Give a Mile, which actually has to do with hospice. Mm -hmm. So what they do is they collect either money or miles donated from different airlines, and they use it to help people who are dying, their family members who don't have enough money to come visit them before mm. they die, and they arrange flights and bring family members in to be with dying patients. I actually sit on their board, and they do some really, really good work out of Canada and the U.S., and uh, I just i am really proud of what they do. That's amazing, man. Not only are we going to donate the money, but I have a lot of miles. I'm going to donate a bunch of my miles because I've got – uh, a million and a half right now, something like that. They sitting. would be very excited to talk. Yeah. To All right. Good to know, man. I love it. Uh, yeah, we just put everything on the Better Life. I mean, uh, with the Better Life and Open Door Capital, I just put them on all these credit cards whenever we have to buy stuff. So let's donate them away. Sorry for the interruption, but this is super actually important. I think you're going to love this. Here's how you become wildly wealthy and ridiculously good looking. How's that for an intro? Look, I know it's an ad, but take some notes. I think this is going to help. First, you set a vision for what you want your future to look like. Then you turn that vision into annual and then quarterly goals. And then you identify the actions that you need to take regularly that are going to get you there. 
Then you track those actions. And then you add on accountability with other high achievers who are tracking theirs to ensure you're actually doing the stuff you know you need to do. And then finally, you improve relentlessly with education and networking. And that's it. You can literally accomplish like anything through that framework. And that is exactly what the Better Life Tribe is. So whether you want to retire young with a multi-million dollar portfolio, uh, real estate deals, or maybe you want to impress your spouse with your amazing six pack or, you know, whatever, something else. The Better Life Tribe is going to get you there. And while the tribe only opens a few days every year, you can be the first to hear about our next opening by joining the wait list at abetterlife.com. Next section of the show. Oh, no, no, we're still on the pivot. You, you didn't do the quote. We did not do the quote. Yeah. The three, two, one pivot. Last question. One pivot quote. So this one, I have to tip my hat to my mother. When I was a little kid, she said something that has profoundly changed my life. And I repeat this to my children all the time. She said, you are already enough. And that sentence mm. has done me such good because any time that I feel like I'm failing or not doing well or that things in life aren't good enough or specifically, I used to think about that a lot when I was going for like a big test, when I had my you know boards or when I had to do something that scared the mm. heck out of me. I remember that I'm already enough and whatever happens today or tomorrow can't take that away from me. Yeah. And I tell my kids all the time, it's like, I don't know what hardship you're going to go through tomorrow. I don't know what's going to happen to you. I don't know what's going to happen to me. But no matter how bad it gets, you are already enough. You don't have to do anything new. You don't have to create anything more. You are already enough. So good. All right, next segment, past, present, future. First question about the past. What's your advice to your younger self? If you could give advice to your younger self. Realize how cool you are back, how cool you were back then. Like mm. I was always so hard on myself mm. that I never appreciated all the things I did right. Like I never appreciated how well I did at school. It's a funny story actually. I felt like I was bad in relationships. I felt like girls never liked me. I was the youngest of three brothers and my oldest brother, strikingly good looking. Women were always paying attention to him. My middle brother was like creative and played the guitar and everyone loved him. And then I was like the youngest. And I thought I wasn't good at anything and I thought no one would ever love me. And there was a time when I looked back at my life and there were all these people who were trying to tell me that I was good enough or that they did like me or wanted to spend time with me or there was all these people who had all this confidence in me, but I didn't have it myself. And so if I could go back I'd be like, man, stop being so hard on yourself. Like, look at all the things you're doing and creating. But you don't know it then, right? Yeah. You're, you're a kid, so you don't, you don't know. Yeah, it's hard to see it when you're in it. It's, uh, it's so true in my life, too. What about something, or let's do present, something that you've recently enacted into your life that's given you a better life? Oh, I came to Maui, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, in a sense, I've given in to, I should put this other, another way. I've stopped caring about the fear associated with doing new things. Mm. And even over the last year or two, I'm just much more likely to throw myself out there and just do it. Regardless if I don't know what the outcome is gonna be, regardless if it could blow up in my face. And so I was telling Alex this the other day, just coming to Maui maybe wouldn't be something that I'd do five years ago. Yeah. But now, if I didn't do that, I wouldn't be here. Like we wouldn't be having this conversation I can't imagine the immeasurable loss I'd have if I hadn't just finally built up the confidence to just go do stuff and walk into walk into the unknown. That's a phenomenal answer, dude. Third question, future. What do you want? We call this kind of the tombstone question, but what do you want your legacy to be? What do you want to be remembered for? So I've been doing a lot of thought about legacy. Um, the reason why is I think we mistake legacy. I think we feel like leg legacy has to be this big audacious thing. We've got to be billionaires or cure cancer, or do all sorts of like big stuff. I've been concentrating a lot on actually being a good pursuer of my purpose and allowing that to affect the people around me. So we talk a lot about generational trauma or genetic trauma. You know, this idea that, for instance, my grandma was an orphan during the Great Depression. Right. So she had issues with food yeah. and scarcity and she passed those down to my mom. And then I had issues where I ate too much and I was always afraid of running out of food, blah, blah, blah. So this is like genetic trauma. But what we don't realize is there's also this thing called genetic growth. Like when you live a purposeful, happy, joyous life that touches other people, 
you pass that down to your kids and the people around you and that little ripple in the ocean persists and carries to places you never thought it would go. So what do I want people to remember me for? That I was passionate about doing the things I love doing, that I was always open to lend a helping hand, that I cared for people, that I used the things I was good at to help other people. Like I went to medical school, learned how to be a doctor, eventually to stop practicing. But even in my financial community, I now can talk to my friends and they can call and say, yeah, my dad just got this diagnosis or my sister is having this problem. And I can give them comfort and help them decide what to do and be there for them. And none of that would have happened if I hadn't become a doctor, this thing that I was running to get away from. And so that's what I hope. I hope people remember me not as the guy who did something amazing or big, but the kind of guy who quietly did the right thing to help people and be purposeful and affect the world. Hmm. That's awesome. Let's hit the wrap up. <laughs> Question number one. What are you excited about? What's coming up in your life? Jeez, what am I not excited about? Um, <laughs> I was very excited about coming here. I'm going to be at the Bogleheads conference soon, so I'm excited about that. My family's talking about going to Spain because my niece is doing a year abroad in Seville, so I'm excited about that. My son just started college, so I'm excited to see how he does. My daughter's starting her sophomore year. My wife and I are starting to plan for this idea of not having kids and maybe spending some time outside the United States during the winters. I mean, I'm excited about my next interview on Friday, <laughs> next podcast guest. I mean, I hate to... I hate to put it this way, but what 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 isn't there to be excited about? Yeah. There's just so much stuff. Mm. And where do people find you? Where do they get this amazing book, Taking Stock? And where do they listen to you and connect with you at? So the easiest way is to go to jordangrummet.com. That's J-O-R-D-A-N-G-R-U-M-E-T.com. There you can find the three ways I create content. I have a medical blog that I don't write at anymore, but it's connected there as well as my financial blog, diversify.com, and the Earn and Invest podcast. Of course, you can find links to the book Taking Stock, or you can find it on Amazon or anywhere you buy books. Check it out, jordangrummett.com. Appreciate you, man. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, man. It's been a blast. Pew.